the Gulf state of Bahrain has been rocked by a series of demonstrations against the Al Khalifa regime. The civil unrest includes street riots and the bombing of hotels. Neighbours of Bahrain are nervous that unrest could spread across the region. On the tiny island state, repression has spawned a climate of fear. And as Sue Lloyd Roberts discovered, any filming of the opposition must be covert. A routine afternoon in Bahrain where demonstrations and arson attacks take place daily. To the outsider, it looks more like Israel's intifada than the Gulf states once renowned as desert oases of stability and reliable friends of the West. The Shia people, the majority here, are in revolt. They're demanding a say in a government which is dominated by the Sunni ruling family. It helps to dress up as a local and you have to entrust yourself to an opposition network that operates in devious ways in a country where scenes like these are strictly out of bounds to journalists and people are imprisoned simply for talking to the BBC. Within minutes of any trouble, the area is cordoned off by riot police, thousands of whom have been imported from the Indian subcontinent to restore order to an island the size of Singapore. Their commander is British, their approach thorough. They round up anyone they find, beating them as they load them onto jeeps headed for brutal interrogation and jail. In another part of the village, they were just as active. This hey. one is my grandfather. Yes. The police came with tear gas and rubber bullets, the boy says. His grandfather's age was no defense. Because he, because he was trying to protect my... They shoot three, three, I, have, I think, three... Three guys who is running here, but this was about uh, five meters only. But it's what's called thousands, I, th I think. And so what is this? Can you show us what this is? What, what are we going to do? It's a rubber shot, this. That's they showed me how the police rampage through their house, and although everyone's keen to tell the story, they're fearful of reprisals, and I'm begged to conceal the faces and voices of those who speak to me. They deserve everything here. No, they deserve everything without any reasons. How many policemen were there? About 35. 35? Yeah, yes, maybe more even, and you can't say anything. If you want to see anyone, make, they'll just hit you and hit you and, problem, and control hit, hit you. The Israel, if you are a child, Lebanon, woman, Lebanese. old man, they don't care. It's behaviour that fuels fury and increases demands that the government here should be made accountable. Even small children who get in the way of the intruders are kicked and beaten. They want to silence our voice. They want to steal our rights. All you want is a parliament. It's the right of everyone in this land. Only through parliament will we get our rights and will the crimes of the government be discovered. Bahrain got rich on oil and foreign banks and businesses flooded in to enjoy the boom. Links with Saudi Arabia have always been close, even more so after the Saudis paid over a billion pounds for the 18-mile causeway that now links the two countries, and the Saudis are watching events in Bahrain with alarm. Sheikh Al Khalifa runs the place like the boss of a large company. One brother is prime minister, the interior minister is his cousin. His power is absolute, he dispensed with the constitution and parliament over 20 years ago to the despair of former MPs. Since the parliament was dissolved, there is no respect for human rights. We are living in a complete state of fear. We do not want to change the government. We just want political reforms. We want to stop corruption, to have social justice and a fair distribution of wealth. Tales of the royal family's immense wealth and paranoia are given credibility by the palaces, dozens of them, which litter the country. You can be arrested for simply walking on the road outside the Amir's palace, and no Bahrainis are employed inside, only foreigners. Outside, the soldiers guarding the palaces are from Pakistan. Foreign workers were employed at every level, a system that served the country well when there was plenty of oil wealth and the locals didn't fancy work. But Bahrain's oil will run out at the end of the century and still the foreigners are being invited in, leaving the locals untrained and increasingly ill-equipped to face the future.
These Shia villages look poor because we don't have money. We don't have work. Half our young people don't go to work. Even if they do, their wages are very low. I'm taken to see how the frustrations are spelled out on every wall of every village, which are remarkable for their poverty as much as for their graffiti. It's a battle fought with spray cans. The slogans are written by protesters at night and crossed out by the police during the day. That one says, Parliament is the solution. Yes to dialogue, not to violence. And here it says, return all political prisoners. And there have been the more violent expressions of anger. Dozens of commercial buildings, hotels and foreign workers' hostels have been attacked by firebombs. Not a day passes without an arson attack somewhere on the island. It's a country where even the university has been built with a police station alongside. The mainly Shia students have been rounded up in their hundreds. Even outside the secondary schools, there are police jeeps on standby in case of trouble. In the past, police have shown no hesitation in invading schools and abusing the pupils. Many children have dropped out of school for fear of being rounded up by police and, intolerable to girls in this conservative Muslim society, stripped naked before being beaten. They took me to the police station and interrogated me, hitting me with every question. You must admit your crimes, they said, and made us sign false confessions. I was kept for 29 days. One night they stripped us naked and made us stand outside until 5 in the morning. The guards enjoyed coming to look at us and they threatened to rape us. In the late afternoon, the protest is renewed. With so many young men in jail, the demonstrators are getting younger, and as news of their treatment by the police gets around, more women are joining in. Many are the wives and mothers of prisoners. We want to be martyrs for the cause, their slogans say. And it's sentiments like these that encourage the government to warn the West that giving in to the opposition will bring about another Iran in the area. The women members of the family of the imprisoned religious leader, Sheikh al Jamri have become the focus of opposition life. All the graffiti where they live call for the Sheikh's release and demand that the government should open a dialogue with the opposition leader. As they showed me around and into their house, they warned that they're under constant surveillance. In the past, they put the village under siege for 15 days. When they finally attacked the village, they killed two people and injured 50 more. They took my husband, Sheikh Al Jimri, away with them. That day, too, the police surrounded the village. But the government accused your husband of wanting to introduce Iranian-type fundamentalism to Bahrain. Is that true? No, no. We are not calling for anything except the restitution of parliament. We are calling for law, dignity and human rights. But you must understand, we have no outside support. It is a people's movement and absolutely local. We want democracy and the rule of law because we feel we are being subjected to the law of the jungle. There are two and a half thousand in prison due to the recent troubles and thousands more who've been released with reports of maltreatment. The women would like me to meet them all, though with so many police watching the houses of suspects, we have to make our appointments with caution. They came in the night and grabbed us from our houses. When we got to the prison, we were immediately tortured. They hang us like this, and then they started beating the soles of our feet until they are swollen. When they get nothing out of us, they keep us for a few days until we are healed, and then they let us go. There have been 20 violent deaths in Bahrain in the last two years, 10 of them judicial executions. The latest, 28-year-old Isa Kamba by firing squad. The law says that no more than five people can meet together. Even these groups of mourners at the martyrs' graves are illegal. And I'm warned to retreat to a safe house. But even here, there's a risk of arrest. The man who took me in said that if they found him helping me, 
the police would send him and his entire family to jail. And yet, so many people were prepared to risk telling Bahrain's tragic story, from those who'd been in prison, were unemployed and so had nothing to lose, to prosperous businessmen who would appear to have a lot at stake. I've got nothing left to lose. I've lost everything. You name it. My passport is nothing. They can have it at any time. My job? They can close my office and send me away. My sisters are all in jail. Their sons are in jail. My brothers, they are all in jail. They can take my wife at any time. So, I have nothing left to worry about. Evenings in Bahrain also have a familiar routine. In the bars, the Saudi tourists enjoy pleasures that are forbidden in their own country, confident in the knowledge that their government, wary of their own opposition, is pouring money into Bahrain to help put down the protest. A few kilometers away, on the outskirts of the city, another demonstration and another plea for a parliament. But with so much at stake in the Gulf, they're unlikely to get help from the Western democracies, and Bahrain's neighbors can be counted on to ensure such dangerous political notions don't spread. Predictably, the police are alerted within minutes by their network of spies, and they respond in force. 70 are arrested on this night alone. With such a formidable police presence, it's hard enough to report on events in this turbulent country, harder still to keep the flames of protest alive. <laughs> 